celebrate that today. There are so many names that we can call you. Abba Father. As we've sung about friend of sinners. Father, you are so much more than anything we could come up with on our own. There is one name under heaven and earth by which all men and women can be saved. And that's who we're singing to this morning. That's who we're talking about. That's who we're trying to connect with, God. Our advocate, the one who took all the sin upon himself.
Father, may you be glorified by these praises. And may you become famous in Jacksonville and in Texas and all over this nation and all over this earth by the preaching of your word. Father, we love you and we praise you and ask that you would bless your message as it is preached in this place today. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. people said. Well, good morning, Central Family. If you have your Bible, Daniel chapter 6 is where we're going to be this morning. I want to encourage you to take your word of God and turn it over there as we talk about a story that is familiar. Uh, there's a danger in doing a story that is familiar because it, the familiarity sometimes, well, it tunes people out. Well, we're taking up a story today that is intimately familiar. It's one we teach to our children from their smallest days as an example of God's faithfulness, as an example of God keeping his promises, and an example of one who had the courage to stand. We're going to take a look at that story, but let's talk about it from a different perspective today. I want you to think with me about the last time you had to wait for something. How patient were you? Yeah, I, that's about right for me. You know, the shortest distance of time known to man is the distance of time between when the, the, the light turns green and you honk at the driver ahead of you. That's like one millinanosecond. I mean, it's really a short period of time because we're not wired to wait, are we? We're, we're wired to do things. We're wired to be active. We're wired to, to, to get things going, especially us men. Uh, we're wired to, to get things done, and waiting is a waste of time. I want you to see today the example of the, the one that is in our character study who helps us understand that sometimes waiting is where we find God. Sometimes waiting is where God shows up in power and authority, and we learn something about God in waiting that we can't learn in activity. So with that in mind, let's stand together as we read from Daniel chapter 6. We're just going to read one verse, although we're going to take most of the whole chapter today. We're going to read verse 10. Word of the Lord reads like this. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published... He went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Pray with me, won't you? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for Daniel, for the example of faithfulness that we see in him. More than that, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are still just as faithful, that your faithfulness did not end with Daniel's story, did not end when the New Testament story started, didn't end when the New Testament ended, didn't end when we rolled over to 2000, didn't end when we rolled over to 2015. Your faithfulness is just as powerful, just as real, just as clear. I thank you today, Lord, that you are in the waiting place with us, that when we have to wait, when we have to trust, when we have to rest in who you are, and we can't solve it ourselves, that we find in you something we can't find somewhere else. Guide us now, Lord Jesus, and may your word be spoken clearly here today. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. A little bit of background here before we get too far gone. You'll see in chapter 6, verse 1, that we've changed characters who are the king. Let's back up to the time period that we are, uh, that we're in. In about 586 B.C., our friend Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were carried away as exiles. They were brought from Jerusalem or the surrounding region all the way to Babylon. And our friend Nebuchadnezzar was the king at that time of Babylon. Uh, about 550 B.C., or about five and a half centuries before the time of Christ, there was a revolution, and the Babylonians were overthrown by the Medes and the Persians, sort of a consortium. They overthrew it, and a new king was installed. His name is Darius. He's the one that we see seated on the throne in the chapter 6, verse 1. It's an important distinction because anytime there's a change in management, there's going to be a change in how things are done, aren't they? 
Well, that's what we see in verse 1. Let's read it together. Verse 1 says this, it, was, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Okay, let's make sure we understand here because this is crucial to understanding the rest of the story. These satraps, 120 of them, scattered out all over the place, sort of like little governorships or, or mayor type roles. They're scattered out all over the kingdom. And these 120 are divided into three groups of 40. And these, these three groups of 40 report back to three guys that are sort of the vice presidents to the king. And these, one of these three is our friend Daniel. Now, here's the extraordinary thing about that. We might be confident in saying that Daniel was the only outsider. You ever been an outsider? One on the outside looking in? Well, if that's true, then you were like Daniel at this point. You were in a situation where you were not necessarily welcome. But let's talk about it from the, the, their end, the, out, the, the insider's perspective for a moment. Pretend for a moment that we are broken up here in Texas into 120 precincts, so to speak. And of those, there are three heads. And one of those heads, one of those three heads is from New York City. How well are you going to receive instruction from them? Okay, you're better than me. I would say, I don't know you. You're not from here. You don't even talk like we do. You don't know what life is like in Texas. How can you rule over us? That was the challenge that our friend Daniel faced. But let's see what happens in verse 3, because verse 3 sort of sets the table for the rest of the chapter. Now, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Did you get that? Daniel was going to get a promotion. He wasn't just going to be one of three anymore. He was going to get an, a promotion to be the only vice president under the king. At this, verse 4, the administrators and the satraps find, tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. If you're one who writes in the margins of your Bible, right out to the side of that, a life of integrity. It's not just a matter of what you do, it's a matter of what you don't do. It's not just a matter of where you go, it's a matter of where you don't go. Daniel had so distinguished himself with his life of integrity that God was about to use him in some amazing and powerful ways. This isn't going to set well with everybody else, but what I want you to see is our friend Daniel. Daniel has lived a life of integrity now, and what do we, what do we think? What do we believe about that? Well, the idea that we have is that if we live a life of integrity, that problems will flee from us, that we won't have struggles. God will owe it to us to do right by us and protect us from those. That's the rumor that floats around. Let me just stop right here and say it's a lie. If you live a life of integrity, I can promise you Satan is going to seek to destroy you. Write it down and sign my name out to the side of it. Write it down and bring, me, bring it to me and I'll sign it for you. I promise you Satan is going to do everything in his power to destroy you if you're living a life of integrity. Expect it, anticipate it, count on it. He wants to destroy you. He wants to mess up everything that God has blessed, Daniel included. Daniel finds himself in a situation where he's doing things right and still is going to be punished for it. Let's pick it up there in verse 5. Uh, verse 5, where's the 5? Yeah, I'll just turn back here. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Hmm. So they knew something clearly about our friend Daniel. They knew that he was a man who loved God. This was his primary quality. This was the characteristic that marked his life most specifically. So they hatched a little plan, a plot, if you will, and here it is. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, make King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into 
the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so it can't be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. So it sounds pretty good to Darius. After all, Darius, let's be honest enough to say that he is a pagan. A pagan meaning he worships a lot of little g gods, a lot of little g gods that are scattered around his, his region. And so adding another one wouldn't be a big deal. However, in this case, they're saying, you, king, are the god to which we must pray. Hey, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Well, let's talk about why they said that. The king already co controlled daily social life. The king already controlled daily economic life. What they're asking for and inviting King Darius into is to control their spiritual lives as well. They're looking to line all these things up, and Darius is hearing that, and he's feeling pretty good about himself, wouldn't you? And he's saying, hey, that sounds pretty good. I like that. I'm going to be exalted that way. But he doesn't understand some of the ramifications that it'll bring. Beware of flattery. When somebody praises you, then beware of it. So says the, the proverb writer. He says, beware of flattery. Just like our friend Darius should have been. What I want you to do, though, is switch back to Daniel for a second. And this is where we'll pick up with the notes. If you want to follow along, you're welcome to. You got it in your worship folder when you came in. Daniel's life of integrity, Daniel's walk of integrity will indeed have its price. It goes along with the idea that no good deed goes unpunished. Daniel is doing things right, and yet he is going to find himself punished. You ever found yourself there? Doing things right, and yet things still are going to roll against you? And have you ever taken that to God and said, God, where are you in all this? Why have you let this happen to me? After all, I'm trying to do right by you. I should just live like the rest of the pagans around me. They're doing better than I am. They're not suffering like I am. I ought to just throw all this aside. After all, I could use a little extra sleep on Sunday morning. I want to caution you against that because it's a very short-term view. It's a very short-term prospect. Take a longer term view because while it may be true for a moment there is another day coming we'll come back to that a little later the life of integrity will indeed have its price now, i want you to see this is the plot that's hatched anybody that prays gets cast into the lion's den to anybody besides darius daniel knows about it and in verse 10 we see him respond Let's pick it up there, shall we? So now Daniel learned about the decree and it had been published. He went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. If you're one who underlines in your Bible, underline that last little part. Just as he had done before. This was the pattern of his life. He wasn't deciding based on pressures or circumstances. He'd already settled this issue. Jump back to chapter 1 and see it again in verse 14 there. Daniel purposed in his heart. He'd already chosen. It wasn't a debate. He knew what he was going to choose. Now I'll even take it a step further. So did they. They knew that they had set their trap, and now they were just waiting for Daniel to step into it. And they would literally be like the cat who ate the canary. Daniel knows something. No, don't, they don't, though. Sometimes, and this is the second point I want you to see, standing firmly happens while you're on your knees. Standing firmly while on your knees. Daniel is going to pray because it's who he is. Daniel is going to pray. Because God has called him to it. Daniel is going to pray and not worry about the circumstances around him. Here's why I'm bringing this out to you today, church. If we're going to have the courage to stand in our culture, in our society, in our time, like Daniel did, then we're going to have to develop the same level of conviction that he did. Because I'm telling you now, Christianity is on the hit list. If you've not noticed it, you ain't paying attention. 
You can't say anything about anybody else without being called intolerant, but Christianity, it's open season. And I'm warning you now, if you're thinking, well, I'll just come to church and it's, that's all that's necessary, you're going to find yourself in a difficult place. Because I believe we are headed toward a time where even church attendance might be considered suspect. Oh, Darren, this is the United States where religious freedom, religious liberty, oh, you, you don't know what you're saying, Darren. Yeah, I do. And that's why I'm warning you about it now. As your pastor and your shepherd, I'm warning you now, there are difficult days coming for us as Christians in the United States. It doesn't give me any joy to say that, but religious liberty doesn't mean what you and I think it means. I don't believe. That's another topic for another day. What I want you to see is this. We're going to have to decide right now. We're going to have to decide right now in advance, and we're going to have to settle it in our hearts and minds whether we're going to obey the law of God or we're going to obey the law of man. Our friend Daniel, he'd already decided it. Our friend Daniel, he'd already settled it. He'd already decided that God's law was far more important to him than man's. Reminds me a lot of what Acts chapter 4 says where Peter and John, the great apostles, came to the same kind of conviction. They came to the same place and they said this, judge for yourself whether it's right to obey you or God. We've already chosen we're obeying God. Do what you have to to us. I'm calling you to realize that because I want you to realize that sometimes the only place you can stand is on your knees. It's a great place to start. Maybe you're like me and there's been times in your life where you've been broken down so bad because of the circumstances that you've faced that the only thing you can do is get on your knees. Well, while you're down there, just start praying because that's where you do your best walking. Standing firmly is where you'll do your best on your knees. This is one of the take-it-home pieces I've got for you. You'll do your best standing when you start on your knees. Get down there and talk to God about what it is. Notice what Daniel did, and that's, let, lets us do the same. He went and gave thanks to his God. Now, why, why I want to point that out to you is this. What is there to be grateful for? He's being hunted, literally. What is there to be grateful for? Well, you heard the song just a moment ago about the names of God, provider, sustainer, healer. That's what to be thankful for, who God is. Not the circumstances around you. Circumstances around us are going to change. God won't. Giving thanks to God just as he had done before. Here's the second thing I want you to realize. Obedience to the law is important. But when you must choose, choose obedience to God's law. Choose that. Because it doesn't change. Laws here change. Laws in God's word don't. Make sure and anchor yourself to that which lasts. Let's move on to the next thing because I want you to see these men waited. They laid their trap and they waited. Verse 11, these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. There's something else to underline, asking God for help. What was it that Daniel was praying? Well, I don't know the Bible doesn't record what Daniel pray, prayer is, but I kind of think it was something like Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes into the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He who watches over Israel neither sleeps nor slumbers. Or maybe like Psalm 40. I waited patiently for my God. I cried out to him from the muck and the mire. He lifted me up and he placed me on a level plain. Or maybe Psalm 18. He rescued me because he delighted in me. It's not because of me, it's because of him. I don't know what he prayed, none of us do, but I gotta believe it was in keeping with those Psalms. And I want you to see it. He prayed asking God for help. And even these guys in verse 11, his conspirators, they knew it too. See what they do with that information in verse 12. So they went to the king. And they spoke to him about his royal decree. Don't you hate rat finks? You know, man. Didn't you publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? See, they're setting the trap for Darius now. You see what's happening? They've set the trap for Daniel and they've caught him. They've set the trap for Darius now and they're about to have both. They're going to put both of them into a situation that is untenable. The king answered, the decree stands. 
in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. That wasn't something Darius anticipated when he thought about putting this decree in place. He let his words overload the rest of him. Or as my grandma used to say, he got too big for his britches. And in that moment, he realized that his own words would be his undoing. Here's the first take it home thing I have for you here. Taste your words before you spit them out. Taste them. What I mean by that is they, if they taste awful in your mouth, then swallow them back again. Don't let them spew out. Because words spoken can't be drawn back. Once they're out there, they're out there. Taste your words. Make sure you listen before you speak. Because it may be something that you don't need to say. Maybe, maybe it's time for you to ask God for help there. Because that's what got Darius into this mess in the first place. He didn't take time to think about it. Instead, he just charged ahead with what sounded good, but it was a trap. See verse 14. That's where we learn just how grieved he really is. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. In other words, he broke out all the law precedents and said, hey, you know what? There's got to be a loophole somewhere. I've got to find a way to save my man here. He's a man of integrity. I can count on him. I cannot afford to lose this guy. I'm going to find a way to rescue him. But he was unable to, and it was greatly distressing to him. Verse 15, our friends are back. Then the men went as a group to Darius, and they said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel, and they threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. Now wonder, second take it home I have for you on this, if you were charged with being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Sure was for Daniel. Did you see it? They wanted to save him, but no, couldn't do it. Couldn't do it because there was too much evidence to convict them. There were things that were obvious. They couldn't let it slide. If you were charged with being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Now, Daniel's not a Christian. Let's be honest enough to say that. But what I want you to see is quite clearly, Daniel is indeed standing firmly on the same God that we stand on. And because he's standing there, we join him in that. And he is thrown, literally, bodily, down into the lion's den. The place of punishment. Well, here's a question that some scholars have asked. Why weren't they using the fiery furnace anymore? Well, we don't really know. But what we do know is this. The lion's den was the preferred method of punishment this time. Well, where did they get the lions? Well, we don't really know that either. But we know they had some of them, at least two. Thus, lion's den, not lion den. And they opened the door and they threw Daniel in and they left him there, presuming that the lions would do what lions do. That was logical. That was reasonable. But I want you to see, here's where we change places. What's reasonable isn't always how God works. What's logical isn't always how God operates. See it there in verse 17. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, and with the rings of his nobles, that Daniel's situation might not be changed. The waiting place. Daniel is now in the waiting place. The waiting place. You may be by yourself, but you are most definitely not alone. You ever been in that place like where Daniel is, where you're forced to wait? Where it's awful quiet? Circumstances look awfully bad. All you can do is wait. 
And so you wait. And you wait. And you wait. You wait for the doctor's report to come back with the news about the latest scan or the latest test. You wait for the report to come back with the score that you got on your last exam. You wait for a yes or a no from a job that you long for. You wait for a response from the bank on the loan that you must have to continue business. You wait to find out if you're going to get to keep your job with layoffs looming all around. You wait. I hate to wait. How about you? Maybe you wait in a more personal sense. You've got an illness, and that illness is one that they don't know what to do with, so they're just continuing to evaluate you, and you, so you wait. Maybe you wait for your spouse, the one you don't have yet, that you have longed for and wanted and desired eagerly, and yet God hasn't yet brought him. Maybe you wait for a child in your home, one that you believe God wants to be there, and yet there are no children in your home. You just wait. Waiting is lonely, waiting is hard, waiting is difficult, and it's always in difficult circumstances. Oh yeah, Daniel, he was in the waiting place. He sat there all night. When you're in that waiting place, you know it's easy to have time to think, have time to pray, have time to reflect. That waiting place, it's a lonely one, isn't it? For Daniel, it sure was. Oh, we had company, at least two lions. Now I want to ask you, can you think of anything in the world worse than having to spend the night with at least two cats? <laughs> Tell the truth now. Some of you are like, I do that every night. Well, God bless you. I'll pray for you. For me, I'll pray against it. We don't know what it was like in that den, but we know that Daniel was there and that he was there alone. The snoring of the lions was the only thing that he heard all night long. You know, though, it's easy to think about our friend Daniel being in that waiting place, but I want you to see in verse 18, there's another one that's in the waiting place too. Verse 18, then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. King Darius is in the waiting place too. He realizes that Daniel is in that waiting place, that place of punishment, innocently because of his words, not because of his misdeeds. He realizes that he has brought this calamity to bear. And he has no one to blame but himself. You ever been in that situation? You ever found yourself limited by your own choices and stuck by your own words? I've got good news for you. God offers second chances. If you're here and you're saying, that's me, I made that mistake, I, I stepped in something there and I really got myself caught, my own words overloaded myself, I got too big for my britches, God allows second chances, church, and we need to embrace them. Daniel is in the lion's den. Darius is in the palace, but they are both in the waiting place. See verse 19. There's a law on the books of the Medes and the Persians that says if the condemned survives the night in their torture chamber, then they are to be absolved. They are to be forgiven for their crimes, because that means that God has protected them and sheltered them throughout the night. Verse 19, at the first light of dawn, the king got up and he hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lion's? Now, we know the answer, but pretend for a moment that you don't, that you're Darius, that history has taught you the answer is a most confident no, that there is going to be silence on the other end. Daniel, stuck down there, 
presumably perished in the night at the hands of these lions, or paws, forgive me, and our friend Darius standing on top saying, I wish I'd chosen better. See how he describes Daniel, and see if it would describe you. Daniel, servant of the living God, living God, as opposed to a dead one. Servant of the living God. Has your God, whom you serve continually. Aha! So there's two verbs there. Serve, used twice. The servant of the living God, who you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the, from the lions. This is not a question of Daniel's skill set. It's a question of God's. So he's really asking a question, is God big enough to rescue you from the circumstances that I've put you in? Well, I'm asking you the same. Is God big enough to rescue you from the circumstances that you're in? Maybe you're in that waiting place right now, and you're saying, I'm not sure God is big enough. Can I just tell you that you are invited to find in God something you won't find somewhere else? Freedom, deliverance, peace, grace, release. You can only find it in his presence. Nowhere else will you find it. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God been able to rescue you? Verse 21, may the king live forever. Wow. To hear Daniel call back. Can you imagine how Darius is voice and heart must have soared my god sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions they have not hurt me because i was found innocent innocent in his sight nor have i done any wrong before you your majesty the king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift daniel out of the den and when daniel was lifted from the den no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Now I want to ask you, do you think there was ever a day that Daniel didn't think back to that day in the lion's den? For the rest of his life, do you think there was ever one day that he didn't think back to the day that God showed himself to be powerful, to be awesome? Was there ever a day that he didn't think back and say, I know I can trust God because of what happened there? He wants that same experience for you, church. For you to find in him the deliverance that you need to bring you from the waiting place. Now see, here's the thing about the waiting place. Waiting place calls on us to be faithful. What we really want to be is successful. I'm telling you today the same thing I told you last week. Faithfulness is greater than success. Would this story be any less powerful if Daniel got eaten by the lions? Well, it would certainly be a different story, wouldn't it? What I'm calling you to today, though, is to see that Daniel isn't a story of success. He's a story of faithfulness. And his time in the lion's den is not reflected because he got out unscathed. It's because God protected him. It's not about Daniel. It's about God. Your story is, too. Now, sometimes we find ourselves in a situation like that, and we can't solve our own problems. We're in one right now here at, here at the church. Just to be quite honest with you, we're in a waiting place. For the calendar year we have thus far, which is also our fiscal year, we're almost $100,000 short of our expected receipts. Some of us are going, wow, this is going to be exciting how we close out the year. And some of us, some of you, are, are perhaps one of the ones who says, you know what, I can do something about that, then you should. But more than money, here's what we need is faithfulness. We need God to show in you that he is who he claims to be where you can trust him with everything, including your finances. Well, what are you doing, Darren, in your waiting place? I'm trying to do the exact same thing Daniel did. I'm trying to do the exact same thing I'm telling you do. Trust God enough to let him decide what happens next. There's no secret bullet. There is no, for, no formula that's secret. There's no shortcuts. It's a matter of trusting God and letting him work it out. I'd rather 
trust God and let him figure out the results than try to solve it on my own. So here's a couple other things I wanna, want you to take home with you. Stand securely even when you're waiting, even while you're waiting. You can find in him the strength you need to keep waiting. And finally, stand confidently in the promises that God has made. What promises do you mean, Darren? I mean like this one. I have come that you may have life and have it to the fullest. John chapter 10, verse 10. In this world you will have troubles, but take heart, I've overcome the world, Jesus said. John 16, verse 33. Or how about this one? I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Or like this one in Hebrews 13, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, Hebrews 13, verse 5. Or maybe in Joshua chapter 1, be strong and courageous, have I not commanded you? The Lord your God is with you wherever you may go. Those are the promises God has made. The problem that we find ourselves in is sometimes we allow our circumstances to be bigger than our God. That's the mistake Daniel didn't make. I'm asking you today if it's one you're making. Perhaps you're here today and you've said, you know what? My God has become smaller than my circumstances. Swap them. Let God be who he is instead of who you've made him to be. Exalt the Savior and you will find in him something you can't find on your own. Pray with me, won't you? Some of us, Lord Jesus, are in that waiting place that place that demands patience and trust. Some of us, Lord Jesus, we confess that we are struggling there because waiting is hard work. Trusting is hard work. We'd rather be active. But Father, we say to you today, like Daniel, stuck. In the den, we lift our eyes and our hearts to you. I pray today, Father, for your hand of strength upon those who are struggling in that waiting place, which is all of us. And I pray today, Father, a special measure of your blessing on those who are struggling with a particular waiting place. I pray for those who are here today who need to trust you today in a new way you grant them courage to step out and come down here and talk about how we make that happen. I pray today, Father, for those who are here today and who are finding in you something they haven't found before. We want to be faithful more than we want to be successful. We realize, Lord, that if we're to have the courage to stand, it won't be because we're so strong, but because you are. Guide us now, Lord Jesus, in this time of invitation. For those who need to make decisions, I pray that you would give them the courage and the boldness to step out and do it. We love you, Father God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So perhaps you're here today and you've never invited Christ into your life. Christ died on the cross for your sins and mine and longs to bring you home. He adopted you and longs to bring you into his family. Meet me right how, here in just a moment, and let's get you connected to his family. Maybe you invited Christ into your life long ago, but you've never been baptized. Come down here and let's get that process started. It's the first step of obedience for the Christian. If you haven't done it, you need to get it fixed up. Maybe you are looking for a church home. Join us here at Central as we serve the Lord together. Maybe you need to come to this altar and talk about a waiting place that you're in. Here's your chance to respond. Stand with me, won't you?